So, I've spent too much time over the couple of years that I've been doing this talking about contrapoints, and I have the same statement every time, which is, I think she's interesting, and I agree with a lot of what she says, but also she came along at a time in my life when I was going through a lot, <laughs> and I sort of stopped taking hormones around the time that she started, although I've never fully detransitioned, and I'm not even sure whether to call myself a man, a woman, or non-binary anymore, um, so I'm just Erica, whatever that means to you. But she made a video a long time ago, simply titled Violence, and if you go on her channel and sort by views, you'll find it is actually the least viewed, and all of the most viewed are different internet drama topics. Um, and I don't know, I thought that was interesting because to me that's always been the most interesting video she put out and probably the most important. And it's kind of ironic that in the video she talks about the movie A Clockwork Orange and how it's uncomfortable to watch because it shows you a narrative through the lens of an extremely violent protagonist that does have redeeming qualities, but none of his actions in the first half of the film have any redeeming value. They're just awful, and we watch that and ask ourselves some uncomfortable questions, and I think it's then befitting that, um, although Clockwork Orange didn't exactly flop, it's befitting that the video she has that actually compels us to look in on ourselves and ask some difficult questions is the one that nobody seems to want to watch. And maybe it's just that it speaks to some aspects of myself that I've spent a lot of time thinking about, because one of the big questions I've asked myself in my life is when is it and when is it not acceptable to use violence? And most of us have the same broad strokes answer, which is, you know, it's acceptable to be violent in an action of self-defense. But, you know, what constitutes self-defense when it comes to these much larger scale phenomena when it comes to not just individual violence, but collective violence in the form of militaries. And she addresses both of those questions. Um, and it's through the lens of philosophy and media, which is what she talks about. And A Clockwork Orange is probably prime example of uh, showing the, this dark side of violence with no redeeming qualities, where the protagonist really does just do it because it's fun for him, and he finds redemption insofar as he does when it no longer provides him with that enjoyment. And this has caused me to think about sort of war movies, and she touches on that a little bit. She talks about those Indonesian gangsters that sort of were able to get away with extremely violent acts fighting communists during the Cold War in Indonesia, which never turned into a Vietnam or Korea type situation, but did have a fair amount of internal strife. And, you know, they say how they were, to some extent, inspired by the violence depicted in movies, because with few exceptions, violence is not depicted as having consequences, right? Even when it's the bad guys, very seldom do their acts of violence lead to any negative 
consequences, right? In A Clockwork Orange, Alex is our protagonist, and he ultimately, to some extent, gets away with it. Um, you know, we don't want to advocate revenge, but... You never really see Alex in A Clockwork Orange being sorry, and... Likewise, those Indonesian gangsters that got hired by the Indonesian government to kill communists, they don't show any remorse either. And in war movies, we sometimes see that we have the converse, where we see the cost of violence. But even in movies like Saving Private Ryan or Fury that show, you know, somewhat graphic depictions of war, although no matter how bloody and graphic the movie is, it's always toning it down a lot. Because if they showed what it actually looked like, nobody would watch it, <laughs> you know. And I have to ask myself, one... Should we have so much cultural enjoyment of violence? And two, when should we actually do it? Because our highest aspiration should be to, you know, and I don't think you have to be religious to agree with this, you know, to turn the other cheek, um, to respond to violence with Nonviolence, which doesn't mean you do nothing. And in the ContraPoints video, she uses the contrived but useful example, because that's what philosophers are good at, is coming up with contrived but helpful to think about examples. Is, you know, what if there was a, a turf Nazi that was about to punch a baby? You know, should you punch the, uh, the turf Nazi to prevent them from punching a baby? And... Um, well, I guess the ideal thing to do would be to just uh, to just you know step in there and take the punch, right? To deter violence with any means necessary other than violence. And to be honest, I've always had a plan that if I ever you know somebody's trying to pick a fight with me, I, strategy is just run away, which I think running is actually an underrated course of action. You know, only times you should stay and fight is if you're unable to get away or if you're with somebody else that is also unable to get away and you have to defend them. And so this brings me into the other thing that's in her video, which is talking about the Richard Spencer punch, which is now a few years ago, and, you know, thank the Lord above, Richard Spencer seems to have uh, disappeared from public uh, view and lost most of his uh, mainstream audience, and that's a good thing. Hopefully we're de-escalating that situation. But, you know, she points out that we weren't just glad that somebody countered him, we were actively enjoying the act of violence against him. And for that matter, I don't think it's a good idea to go, you know, punch a Nazi, because it's true that the Nazis succeeded in taking power in Germany because they were able to do these things like beer hall push and whatnot, where they were able to be violent and nobody really stopped them. But it was primarily that they were able to depict themselves as the victims, right, of violence, when in actuality they were the perpetrators overwhelming majority of the cases, but they were able to say, look, see the communists, they're the ones that are being violent and we're offering, you know, stability and peace and all these things. And it was, you know, none of that was true. They were the ones being violent. But when you use extrajudicial violence against fascists, you help them paint themselves as the good guys and it lends them credibility and few things are as dangerous as that. And the other danger, of course, is that our enjoyment of the violence of like, yeah, somebody finally stuck it to Richard Spencer and just punched him, 
you know, that, that enjoyment will continue long after the justification has evaporated, right? And so I think a lot about uh, sort of romanticizing of the Second World War, where our use of violence certainly was justified, but media depictions of the war ever since have taken that as a license to glorify the conflict. And there's very few movies that genuinely depict how awful it was. Um, like... I, I have a I have a lot of World War II movies I enjoy, but um, a couple of my favorites made many years apart are um, so first of all is actually Letters from Iwo Jima, which uh, only got made because Clint Eastwood wanted to make Flags of Our Fathers, which is a pretty decent movie and does depict a lot of the downsides of war, but at the end of the day does still kind of glorify it. Uh, but letter he the the Japanese government you know Iwo Jima is just a tiny little scrap of an island. There's not much private land. It's pretty much owned by the Japanese government. So to get permission to film there, Clint Eastwood had to get permission from the Japanese government and all their film boards, and they would only approve it if he also made a movie from the Japanese point of view. And of course, from the Japanese point of view, it, it was senseless, right? Because, you know, from our point of view, it's like, you know, there had been a hostile militaristic government in Japan that sort of compelled their people to go to war. So from our point of view, like, you know, our soldiers, sailors, marines had to go. But from their point of view, it's like, man, if only it hadn't been for those, you know, stupid jerks in charge that wanted to have a conflict for no good reason, we could have avoided this whole mess. And I think Letters from Iwo Jima does a better job of depicting that than Flags of Our Fathers, even though Flags of Our Fathers is a very good movie. Um, and it, again, it, it, they, they both tone it down. No war movie shows how graphic it really is, because if they actually showed it, you would not watch it. And movies do not exist to prove a point. They exist to entertain and to sell tickets at the end of the day. So the other one I, I like, though, is, is, a, is a movie that people haven't seen in a while, which is called Mr. Roberts. Um, and it's about a supply ship, actually. And, you know, spoilers for this, you know, 50-year-old movie, but... Uh, it's, they, they don't see combat the whole time, right? It's just these guys out in the middle of the Pacific, you know, chugging along, you know, trying to get through day by day with the boredom. Um, and there's one officer on the ship uh, who is kind of the, you know, the, the nice guy officer that, you know, kind of takes care of the enlisted sailors because uh, the captain is kind of a jerk. Um, and uh, that, that's, you know, Mr. Mr. Lieutenant Roberts. Um, and he then... Uh, keeps asking to get assigned to a real combat ship, and in the end of the movie, he finally gets a you know an assignment to a, a, a cruiser or a destroyer, uh, and then the rest of the supply ship's crew gets a letter uh, saying that he's been killed. Um, you know, and that's one of the few movies that I thought they don't show any of the graphic nature because there's, there's no combat scenes. Um, they actually did you know show the downside because you, you spend two hours getting attached to these characters and you know, seeing them just deal with their day-to-day -day life, and then at the end, it's just, one of them is just gone, um, you know. Uh, there's not, there's not a whole lot of, uh, films like that, uh, and that's not a, you know, back in the old days thing, you know, the, in fact, the movies released about World War II in the 50s were some of the most egregious offenders, because, you know, you couldn't show anything graphic on, on film, uh, but you could, you know, depict killing people as fun all day long if you wanted to. Um, so, I don't know back to the because uh, you know back back to the uh, to the contrapoints though because she doesn't really talk about war movies but she does talk about these 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 theories of of uh, of violence with regards to uh, internal violence um, you know and uh, going back to the topic of fascism it's like There is a point where it becomes necessary to fight totalitarian fascist regimes with violence. And religiously, I do struggle with how to ever justify any amount of the use of force, but it's clearly necessary at a certain point. 
But that, I think, behooves us as a society to place tremendous weight on preventing it from ever getting to that point. Um, and we seldom do. Um, you know, and that's a lot of that involves sort of these internal issues, which ContraPoints addresses with these sort of, you know, notions of the these French philosophers talking about, um, you know, when, you know, they're basically, you know, communists talking about when the use of force on the part of the revolution is and isn't justified. And I'll essentially argue that it's never a good idea because all it does is either leads to, you know, totalitarian regimes like the Soviet Union, or even worse, it gives credibility to the fascist cause by saying, look, see, the communist leftists are being violent, we need to use violence to suppress them, uh, and then that's how fascism takes over. Uh, and so this is an area where I agree with at least old Natalie, where she would say that, you know, her hang-up about violence sort of favors the status quo, and that's true to some extent, but it's also a strong protection against fascism. Because, well, we have still a society that where the risks of violence are distributed unevenly. Um, you know, people that are lower class and people of color have a triple whammy. First of all, they are disproportionately the people that are willing to serve in our military and write us that blank check up to and including their lives. And that's, I don't know, I don't think people realize just how much uh, we sort of, oh, I mean, it's hard to phrase this correctly, but like, like when they talk about, you know, diversity in the military and whatnot, I don't think people understand the extent to which we would not be free without that. Because people from all over our society are willing to do that, but the military is more diverse than pretty much any other organization in this country. And sorry, I, I, I'm talking all about violence being bad. I am a bit of an obnoxious U.S. military stan, um, but I try to keep it to a minimum. Um, and, of course, the other thing is, I think she talks about, you know, there's police violence, and that's something we also don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about, you know, it's, uh, again, tying into being her least viewed video, right, it's like, when it's in the 24-hour news cycle, and it's, you know, the cool thing to, you know, be out there, everybody's hyped about it, but then, you know, time goes by, and there's, when there's actually time and political capital available to do something, people seem to lose interest. Um, but that's the time to fix the problem, not when it has become a, like, high-visibility disaster. And I wish people would do something about it now, but I don't know. So it's hard to come to a useful conclusion just like she didn't exactly. Other than it's wrong to harm, but it's right to protect. And maybe we should spend less time enjoying violence and more time trying to figure out how to prevent it. And that does involve political action when it's not necessarily going to be a public relations boon for you. So we could all do better, but <laughs> it is poetic that violence remains her least viewed video. I don't know. 
Peace, y'all.